Chapter Six, Part Two, of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Six: The Age Limit, Part Two. It made a mess, a nasty mess, from the standpoint of traffic, as nasty a mess as the Hill Division had ever faced. The rear of the freight went to Matchwood, the 1608, the baggage, and two Pullmans turned turtle, derailing the remaining cars behind, but by a miracle, it seemed, there wasn't anyone seriously hurt. Scared, yes, pretty badly. The directors, a shaken white-lipped crowd, poured out of the observation car to the track side. There was no cigar in H. Harrington Campbell's mouth. It was dark by then but the wreckage caught fire and flung a yellow glow far across the canyon, and in a shadowy way lighted up the immediate surroundings. Train crews and engine crews of both trains hurried here and there. Torches and lanterns began to splutter and wink. Hoarse shouts began to echo back and forth, adding their quota to a weird medley of escaping steam and crackling flame. Regan, from a hasty consultation with old Dan McCaffery and old Pete Chartrand, that sent the two men on the jump to carry out his orders, turned to face H. Harrington Campbell. "'Nobody hurt, sir, thank God,' puffed the fat little master mechanic, in honest relief. H. Harrington Campbell's eyes were on the retreating forms of the engineer and conductor. Oh, "'Indeed,' he said coldly. But "'The whole affair is hardly worth mentioning, I take it. Quite a common occurrence.' "'You've got some pretty old men handling your trains out here, haven't you?' Regan's face went hard. "'They're pretty good men,' he said shortly. "'And there's no blame coming to them for this, Mr. Campbell, if that's what you mean.' H. Harrington Campbell's fingers went tentatively to his vest pocket for a cigar, extracted the broken remains of one, the relic of his own collision with the back of a car seat where the smash had hurled him, and threw it away with an icy smile. "'Blame,' expostulated H. Harrington Campbell, ironically. "'I don't want to blame anyone. I'm looking for someone to congratulate. On the worst-run division and the most pitiful exemplification of near-railroading I've had any experience with in twenty years, Mr. Regan.' For a full minute Regan did not speak. He couldn't. And then the words came away with a roar from the bluff little master mechanic. By a glory, he exploded. We don't take that kind of talk out here even from general managers. We don't have to. That's straight enough, ain't it? Well, I'll give you some more of it. Now I've started. I don't like you. I don't like that pained look on your face. I've been filling up on you all morning, and you don't digest well. We don't stand for anything as raw as that from any man on earth. And you needn't hunt around for any greased words, as far as I'm concerned, to do your firing with. You can have my resignation as master mechanic of the worst-run division you've seen in twenty years right now, if you want it, hmm? H. Harrington Campbell was gallingly preoccupied. Uh, how long are we uh, stalled here for? Uh, the rest of the night? He inquired irrelevantly. Regan stared at him a moment, still apoplectic. "'I've ordered them to run the forward end of the freight to Eagle Pass and take you down,' he said, choking a little. "'There's a couple of flats left whole that you can pile yourselves and your baggage on, and down there they'll make up a new train for you.' Oh, "'Very good,' said H. Harrington Campbell, curtly. And ten minutes later the director special, metamorphosized into a string of boxcars with two flats trailing on the rear, on which the newly elected board of the transcontinental sat, some on their baggage and some with their legs hanging over the sides, pulled away from the wreck and headed down the grade for Eagle Pass. Funny, the transition from the luxurious leather upholstery of the observation to an angry, chattering mob of magnates clinging to each other's necks as they jounced on the flooring of an old flat? Well, perhaps... It depends on how you look at it. Regan looked at it, and Regan grinned for the pure savagery that was in him. But I guess, said Regan to himself as he watched them go, I guess maybe I'll be looking for that job on the pen after all, hmm? Everybody talked about the director's special run, naturally, 
and naturally everybody wondered what was going to come from it. It was an open secret that Regan had handed one to the general manager without any candy coating on the pill, and the Hill Division sort of looked to see the master mechanic's head fall and Regan go. But Regan did not go, and for that matter, nothing else happened for a while. Carleton came back and got the rights of it from Regan, and said nothing to Regan about his reply to H. Harrington Campbell's letter, in which he had stated that if they were looking for a new master mechanic there would be a division superintendency vacant at the same time. The day man at Mitre Peak quit railroading, without waiting for an investigation. Old Dan McCaffery and Billy Dawes went back to their regular run with the 304, and the division generally settled down again to its daily routine, and from the perspective of distance, if the truth be told, got to grinning reminiscently at the run the big bugs had had for their money. Only the grin came too soon. A week or so passed, payday came and went, and the day after that a general order from the east hit the Hill Division like a landslide. Carleton slit the innocent-looking official manila open with his paper knife, chucked the envelope in the wastebasket, read the communication, read it again with gathering brows, and sent for Regan. He handed the form to the master mechanic without a word as the latter entered the office. Regan read it, read it again as his chief had, and two hectic spots grew bright on his cheeks. It was brief, curt, cold. For the good of the service, safety, and operating efficiency, it stated, in a word, on and after the first of the month, the services of employees over the age of sixty years would no longer be required. Those were early days in railroading, not a word about pensions, not a word about half pay, just sixty years and out. The paper crackled in Regan's clenched fists. Carleton was beating a tattoo on his teeth with the mouthpiece of his pipe. There wasn't another sound in the office for a moment. Then Regan spoke, and his voice broke a little. "'It's a damned shame,' he said through his teeth. "'It's that skunk Campbell.' "'How many men does it affect?' asked Carleton, looking through the window. "'I don't know,' said the little master mechanic bitterly. "'But I know one that it'll hit harder than all the rest put together, and that's old Dan McCaffery.' There was hurt in the super's gray eyes as he looked at the big-hearted little master mechanic's working face. "'I was thinking of old Dan myself,' he said in his low, quiet way. "'He hasn't a cent!' stormed Regan. "'Not a cent! Not a thing on earth to fall back on! Think of it! Him and that little old missus of his, God bless her sweet old face, that have been scrimping all these years to pay back what that blasted kid robbed out of the bank. It ain't right, Carlton, it ain't right! It's hell, that's what it is! Sixty years!' There ain't a better man ever pulled a latch in a cab. There ain't a better one pulling one anywhere today than old Dan McCaffery, and, and I kind of feel as though I were to blame for this in a way. To blame, repeated Carleton. I put him on that run, and Riley put old Pete Chartrand on. It kind of stuck them under Campbell's nose. The two of them together, the two oldest men, and the blamedest luck that ever happened on a run. Hmm? Carleton shook his head. I don't think it would have made any difference in the long run, Tommy. I told you there'd be changes as soon as the new board got settled in the saddle. Regan tugged viciously at his scraggly brown mustache. Maybe, he growled fiercely. But Campbell's seen old Dan now, or I'd put one over on that pup, I would. There ain't any birth register that I ever heard of out in the mountains, and if Dan said he was fifty, I'd take his word for it. Dan wouldn't say that said Carleton quietly. Not even to hold his job. No, of course he wouldn't, spluttered the fat little master mechanic, belligerently inconsistent, who said he would. And anyway, it wouldn't do any good. Campbell asked him his age, and Dan told him, and, and oh, what's the use? I know it. I know I'm only talking, Carleton. Neither of them said anything for a minute. Then Regan, pacing up and down the room, spoke again. It's a clean sweep, eh? Twain crews, engine crews, everything. There ain't any other job for him. 
Over sixty is out everywhere. A white man, one of the whitest. Regan sort of said it to himself. Old Dan McCaffrey. Who's to tell him? Carleton drew a match with a long crackling noise under the arm of his chair. Me, said Regan, and his voice broke again. He stopped before the desk and, leaning over, stretched out his arm impulsively across it. I'd rather have that arm cut off than tell him, Carleton, he said huskily. I don't know what he'll say. I don't know what he'll do. But I know it'll break his heart and break Mrs. McCaffrey's heart, Carleton. He took another turn the length of the room and back again. But I guess it had better be me, said the little master mechanic more to himself than to Carleton. I guess it had... Oh, I hate to think of his getting it so's it would hurt any more than it had to. Hmm? And so Tommy Regan told old Dan McCaffrey that afternoon, the day after payday. Regan didn't mean to exactly, not then. He was kind of putting it off, as it were, until next day, and, and fretting himself sick over it. But that afternoon old Dan, on his way down to the roundhouse, Dan took out the regular passenger local that left Big Cloud at 6.55 every evening, and to spend an hour ahead of running time with the 304 was as much a habit with Dan as breathing was, hunted Regan up in the latter's office just before the six o'clock whistle blew. For an instant Regan thought the engineer had somehow or other already heard the news, but a glance at Dan's face dispelled that idea as quickly as it had come. Dan was always smiling, but there was a smile on the wizened, puckered, honest old face now that seemed to bubble out all over it. Regan, said old Dan, bursting with happy excitement, I just had to drop in and tell you on the way over to the roundhouse, and the missus, she says, you tell Mr. Regan, Dan, he'll be right down glad. Regan got up out of his chair. There seemed a sense of disaster coming somehow that set him to breathing heavily. Sure, Dan, sure he said weakly. What is it? Well, said Dan, you know that that trouble the boy got into back, uh, back. Yes, I know, said Regan hastily. Well, said Dan, taken a long time, a good many years, but yesterday, you know, was payday, and today Regan, we, the missus and me, Regan, sent the last of that money east, interest and all, the last cent of it cleaned it all up. Say, Regan, I feel like I was walking on air, and you'd like to have seen the missus sitting up there in the cottage and smiling through her tears. Oh, oh Dan, she says, and then she gets up and, and puts her two hands on my shoulders, and I, I felt blame near like crying myself. We can start in now, Dan, to save up for old age, she says, smiling. Say, Regan, ain't it, ain't it fine? We're going to start in now and save up for old age. Regan didn't say a word. Came with a rush, choking him up in his throat and something misty in front of his eyes so he couldn't see. And he turned his back, searching for his hat on the peg behind his desk. He jammed his hat on his head and jerked it low down over his forehead. Ain't, ain't you glad? said old Dan, and sort of puzzled hurt in his eyes. "'I'll walk a bit of the way to the roundhouse with you, Dan,' said Regan gruffly. "'Come on.' They stepped out of the shops and across a spur, old Dan, still puzzled, striding along beside the master mechanic. What, "'What's the matter, Regan?' he asked reproachfully. "'I thought you'd be—' And then Regan stopped, and his hand fell in a tight grip on the other's shoulder. "'I got to tell you, Dan,' he blurted out, "'but I don't need to tell you what I think of it.' It's a damned shame. The new crowd that's running this road don't want anybody helping them to do it after the first of the month that's over sixty years of age. You're... you're out. Old Dan didn't seem to get it for a minute. Then a whiteness kind of crept around his lips and his eyes. From Regan seemed to circuit in a queer, wistful way about the yards, and fix finally on the roundhouse in front of him and then he lifted his peaked cap in the way he had of doing and scratched near his ear where the hair was. He hit Regan pretty hard with what he said. Regan, he said, there's two weeks yet to the end of the month. Don't tell her, Regan, and, and don't you let the boys tell her. 
There's two weeks she don't need to worry. I'd kind of like to have her have them two weeks. Regan nodded. There weren't any words that would come, and he couldn't have spoken them if there had. Yes, said old Dan, kind of whispering to himself. I'd kind of like to have her have them two weeks. Regan cleared his throat, pulled at his mustache, swore under his breath, and cleared his throat again. What'll you do, Dan, afterwards? Old Dan straightened up, looked at Regan, and smiled. I don't know, he said, shaking his head and smiling. I don't know, but it'll be all right. We'll get along somehow. His eyes shifted to the roundhouse again. I guess I better be getting over to the 304, he said, and turned abruptly away. Regan watched him go, watched the overalled figure with a slight shoulder stoop cross the turntable, watched until the other disappeared inside the roundhouse doors, and then he turned and walked slowly across the tracks and uptown toward his boarding house. Don't tell her. The words kept reiterating themselves insistently. Don't let the boys tell her. I guess they won't, said Regan, muttering fiercely to himself. I guess they won't. Nor did they. The division and Big Cloud kept the secret for those two weeks, and they kept it for long after that. The little old lady in the lace cap never knew. They ranked her high, those pioneering women kind of hers in that little mountain town, those rough-and-ready toilers who had been her husband's mates. She never knew. But everybody else knew, and they watched old Dan as the days went by, watched him somehow with a tight feeling in their throats and kept aloof a little, because they didn't know what to say, kept aloof a little awkwardly, as it were. Not that there seemed much of any difference in the old engineer, it was more as something that they sensed. Old Dan came down to the roundhouse in the late afternoon, an hour before train time, just as he always did, puttered and oiled around and coddled the 304 for an hour, just as he always did, just as though he was always going to do it. Took his train out, came back on the early morning run, backed the 304 into the roundhouse, and trudged up Main Street to where it began to straggle into the buttes, to where his cottage and the little old lady were, just as he always did. And the little old lady, with the debt paid, went about the town for those two weeks happier-looking, younger-looking than Big Cloud had ever seen her before. That was all. But Regan, worrying, pulling at his mustache, put it up to little Billy Dawes, old Dan's fireman, one day in the roundhouse near the end of the two weeks. "'How's Dan take it in the cab, Billy?' he asked. The little fireman rolled the hunk of greasy waste in his hands and swabbed at his fingers with it for a moment before he answered. Then he sent a stream of blackstrap juice viciously into the pit and with a savage jerk hurled the hunk of waste after it. "'By God!' he said fiercely. Regan blinked and waited. "'Just the same as ever he was,' said Billy Dawes, huskily, after a silence. "'Just the same, when he thinks you're not looking.' I've seen him sometimes when he didn't know I was looking. Regan said, <clears throat> kind of coughed it out, reached for his plug as was usual with him in times of stress, bit into it deeply, sputtered something hurriedly about new piston rings for the left-hand head, and muttering to himself left the roundhouse. And that night old Dan McCaffrey took out the 304 and the local passenger for the run west and the run back east, just as he always did, and the next night, and for two nights after that, he did the same. Came then the night of the 31st. It was the fall of the year, and the dusk fell early, and by a little after six, with the oil lamps lighted, that at best only filtered spasmodic yellow streaks of gloom about the roundhouse, the engines back on the pits were beginning to loom up through the murk in big, grotesque, shadowy shapes, as Regan, crossing the turntable, paused for a moment hesitantly. Why he was there, he didn't know. He hadn't meant to be there. He was just a little early for his nightly game of Pedro with Carlton over in the super's office. It wasn't much more than half-past six, so he had had some time to put in. That must be about the size of it. He hadn't meant to come. There wasn't any use in it. 
No, none at all, not nothing he could do. Better, in fact, if he stayed away. Only he had left the boarding house early, and he was down there now, standing on the turntable, and it was old Dan's last run. I guess, mumbled Regan, I'll, I'll go back over to the station. Carlton will be along in a few minutes. I guess I will. Hmm? Only Regan didn't. He started on again slowly over the turntable and entered the roundhouse. There wasn't anybody in sight around the pit on which the 304 stood, nobody puttering over the links and motion gear, poking here and there solicitously with a long-spouted oil can, as he had half, more than half, expected to find old Dan doing. But he heard someone moving about in the cab and caught the flare of a torch. Regan walked down the length of the engine and peered into the cab. It was Billy Dawes. "'Where's Dan, Billy? Ain't he about?' inquired Regan. The fireman came out into the gangway. "'Yes,' he answered. "'He's down there back of the tender by the fitter's benches. He's looking for some washers he said he wanted for a loose stud-nut. I'll get him for you.' "'No, never mind,' said Regan. "'I'll find him.' It was pretty dark at the rear of the roundhouse in the narrow space between the engine tenders on the various pits and the row of workbenches that flanked the wall, and for a moment, as Regan reached the end of the 304's tender, he could not see anyone, and then he stopped short, as he made out old Dan's form down on the floor by the end bench as though he were groping for something underneath it. For a minute, two perhaps, Regan stood there motionless, watching old Dan McCaffrey. Then he drew back, tiptoed softly away, went out through the engine doors, and as he crossed the tracks to the station platform, brushed his hand hurriedly across his eyes. Regan didn't play much of a game of Pedro that night. His heart wasn't in it. Carlton had barely dealt the first hand when Regan heard the 304 backing down and coupling on the local, and he got up from his chair and walked out to the window and stood there watching until the local pulled out. Carlton didn't say anything, just dealt the cards over again and began once more as Regan resumed his seat. An hour passed. Regan, fidgety and nervous, played in a desultory fashion. Carlton, disturbed, patiently correcting the master mechanic's mistakes. The game was a farce. "'What's the matter, Tommy?' asked Carlton gravely as Regan made a misdeal twice in succession. "'Nothing,' said Regan shortly. "'Go on, play. It's your bid.' Carlton shook his head. "'You're taking it too much to heart, Tommy,' he said. "'It won't do you any good, either of you. You or Dan. He'll pull out of it somehow. You'll see.' There was a queer look on Regan's face as he stared for an instant at Carlton across the table, and he opened his lips as though to say something, and closed them again in a hard line instead. Carlton bid. "'It's yours,' said Regan. Carlton led, and then Regan, with a sweep of his hand, shot his cards into the center of the table. "'It's no good,' he said gruffly, getting up. "'I can't play the blamed game tonight. I—' He stopped suddenly and turned his head as a chair scraped sharply in the dispatcher's room next door. A step sounded in the hall. The super's door flung open, and Spence put in his head. One glance at the dispatcher, and Carlton was on his feet. "'What's the matter, Spence?' he asked, quick and hard. Regan hadn't moved. But Regan spoke now, answering the question that was addressed to the dispatcher, and answering it in a strangely assertive, absolute, irrefutable way. "'The local,' he said. "'Number 47. Dan McCaffrey's dead.' Both men stared at him in amazement, and Spence sort of unconsciously nodded his head. "'Yes,' said Spence, still staring at Regan. "'There was some sort of engine trouble just west of Big Eddie in the Beaver Canyon.' I haven't got the rights of it yet, only that somehow McCaffrey got his engine stopped just in, just in time to keep the train from going over the bridge embankment and, and went out doing it. There's no one else hurt. Dawes, the fireman, and Conductor Neal walked back to Big Eddie. I got them on the wire now. Come into the room. Regan stepped to the door mechanically, and with Carlton behind him, followed Spence into the dispatcher's room. There Carlton, tight-lipped, leaned against the table. Regan, his face like stone, took his place at Spence's elbow as the dispatcher dropped into his chair. 
There wasn't a sound in the room for a moment save the clicking of the sender in a quick tattoo under Spence's fingers. Then Spence picked up a pencil and began scribbling the message on a pad as the sounder spoke. Billy Dawes was dictating his story to the Big Eddy operator. It was just west of Big Eddy, just before you get to the curve at the approach to the Beaver Bridge, came Dawes's story. And we were hitting up a fast clip, but no more than usual when we got a jolt in the cab that spilled me into the coal and knocked Dan off his seat. It all came so quick there wasn't any time to think, but I knew we'd shed a driver on Dan's side, and the rod was cutting the side of the cab like a knife through cheese. I heard Dan shout something about the train going over the embankment and into the river if we ever hit the beaver curve, and then he jumped for the throttle in the air. There wasn't a chance in a million for him, but it was the only chance for every last one of the rest of us. He made it somehow. I don't know how. It's all a blur to me. He checked her, and then the rod caught him, and... The sounder broke, almost with a human sob in it, it seemed, and then went on again. We stopped just as the 304 turned turtle. None of the coaches left the rails. That's all. Regan spoke through dry lips. Ask him what Dan was like in the cab tonight, he said hoarsely. Spence looked up and around at the master mechanic as though he had not heard her right. Ask him what I say, repeated Regan shortly. What was Dan like in the cab tonight? Spence bent over his key again. There was a pause before the answer came. He says he hadn't seen Dan so cheerful for months, said Spence presently. Regan nodded, kind of curiously, kind of as though it were the answer he expected, and then he nodded at Carleton, and the two went back to the super's room. Regan closed the door behind him. Carleton dropped into his chair, his gray eyes hard and full of pain. "'I don't understand it, Tommy,' he said heavily. "'It's almost as though you knew it was going to happen.' Regan came across the floor and stood in front of the desk. I did, he said in a low way. I think I was almost certain of it. Carleton pulled himself forward with a jerk in his chair. Do you know what you're saying, Tommy? he asked sharply. I'll tell you, Regan said in the same low way. I went over to the roundhouse tonight before Dan took the 304 out. I didn't see Dan anywhere about, and I asked Dawes where he was. Dawes said he'd gone back to the fitter's benches to look for some washers. I walked on past the tender, and I found him there, down on the floor on his knees by one of the benches. But he wasn't looking for any washers. He was praying. With a sharp exclamation, Carlton pushed back his chair and, standing, leaned over the desk toward Regan. Regan swallowed a lump in his throat and shook his head. He didn't see me, he said brokenly. He didn't know I was there. He was praying aloud. I heard what he said. It's been ringing in my head all night, word for word, while I was trying to play with those. He jerked his hand toward the scattered cards on the desk between them. I can hear him saying it now. It's the queerest prayer I ever heard, and I guess he prayed the way he lived, as though he was kind of uh, intimate with God. Yes, prompted Carlton softly as Regan paused. Regan turned his head away, and his eyes filled suddenly, and his voice was choked. What he said was this, just as though he was talking to, to you or me. You know how it is, God. I wouldn't take that way myself unless you fixed it up for me, because it wouldn't be right unless you did it. But I hope, God, you'll think that's the best way out of it. You see, there ain't anything left as it is, but if we fixed it up that way, there'd be the fraternal insurance to take care of the missus, and she wouldn't never know. And then, you see, God, I guess my work is all done, and I'd kind of like to quit while I was still on the payroll. I'd kind of like to finish that way, and tonight's the last chance. You understand, God, don't you? Regan's lips were quivering as he stopped. There was silence for a moment, and Carleton looked up from the blotter on his desk. Tommy, he said in his big, quiet way as his hand touched Regan's sleeve, tell me why you didn't stop him then from going out tonight. 
Regan didn't answer at once. He went over to the window and stared out at the twinkling switch lights in the yards below. He was still staring out of the window as he spoke. He didn't put it up to me, said Regan. He put it up to God. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven, Part One of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Seven, The Devil and All His Works, Part One. McGuire was a little washed out kind of toil bent hostler in the roundhouse, and he married old. How old? Nobody knew, not even old Bill himself, fifty something. Mrs. McGuire presented him with a son in due course, and the son's name was Patrick Burke McGuire. But the Hill Division, being both terse and graphic by nature and education, called him Noodles. Noodles wasn't even a pretty baby. Tommy Regan, who was roped in to line up at the baptismal font and act as godfather because old Bill was a boiler washer in the roundhouse, which was reason enough for the big-hearted master mechanic, said that Noodles was the ugliest and most forbidding-looking specimen of progeny he had ever seen outside a zoological garden. Of course, be it understood, Regan wasn't a family man, and godfathering wasn't a job in Regan's line. So when he got outside the church, and the perspiration had stopped trickling nervously down the small of his back, and he'd got a piece of black strap clamped firmly home between his teeth, he told old Bill, by way of a grim sort of revenge for the unhappy position his good nature had led him into, that the offspring was the dead spit of its father, and he congratulated Noodles. The irony, of course, was lost. The boiler washer walked on air for a week. He told the roundhouse what Regan had said, and the roundhouse laughed. Bill thought the roundhouse thought he was lying, but that didn't dampen his spirits any. It wasn't everybody could get the master mechanic of the division to stand up with their kids. Everybody was happy, except Noodles. Noodles, just about then, developed colic. Noodles got over the colic got over the measles, the mumps, the whooping cough, and the scarlet fever. That may not have been the order of their coming or their going, but he got over them all. And when he was twelve, he got over the smallpox. But he never got over his ugliness. The smallpox kind of put a stop order on any lurking tendency there might have been in that direction. Also, when he was twelve, he got over all the schooling the boiler washer's limited means would span, which wasn't a university course, and he started in railroading as a call boy. There was nothing organically bad about Noodles, except his exterior, which wasn't his fault. One can't be blamed for hair of a mottled red, ubiquitous freckles wherever the smallpox had left room for them, no particular colored eyes, a little round knob of uptilted nose, and a mouth that made even the callous duchy at the lunch counter feel a little mean inwardly when he compared it with the mathematically cut slab of contract pie, eight slabs to the pie plate, and so much so that he went to the extent of, no, he never gave Noodles an extra piece, but he went to the extent of surreptitiously pocketing Noodles' nickel as though he were obtaining money under false pretenses, which was a good deal for Dutchy to do, and just shows. There was nothing organically bad about Noodles, not a thing. Noodles' troubles, and they came thick and fast with the inauguration of his railroad career, lay in quite another direction. His irrepressible tendency to practical jokes, coupled with a lack of the sense of the general fitness of things, consequences, and results, and an absence of even a bowing acquaintance with responsibility that was appalling. The first night Noodles went on duty as call boy, armed with a nickel thriller, that being only half the price of a regular dime novel, and visions of the presidency of the road being offered him before he was much older, Spence was sitting in on the early night trick. There was a lot of stuff moving through the mountains that night, and the train sheet was heavy, and even Spence, counted one of the best dispatchers that ever held down a key on the Hill Division, was hard put to it, 
both to keep his crowding sections from treading on each other's heels, and to jockey the east and west bounds past each other without letting their pilots get tangled up head on. It was no night and no place for foolishness. A dispatcher's office never is, for that matter. Noodles curled himself up in a chair behind the dispatcher and started in on the thriller. His first call was for the cruise of number 72, the local freight east at 835, and there was nothing to do until then unless Spence should happen to want him for something. The thriller was quite up to the mark, even thriller than usual, but Noodles left the hero at the end of the first chapter securely bound to the mill-wheel, with the villain rushing to open the gate in the dam, and his eyes strayed around the room. It wasn't altogether the novelty of his surroundings. No phase of railroading was altogether a novelty to any Big Cloud youngster. There was just a sort of newness in his own position that interfered with any protracted or serious effort along literary lines. From a circuit of the room his eyes went to the fly-specked green-shaded lamp on the dispatcher's table, then from the lamp to the dispatcher's back, and fixed on the dispatcher's back. His eyes held there quite a long time. Then his fingers went stealthily to the lapel of his coat. Spence had a habit, when hurried or anxious, of half rising from his chair, as though to give emphasis to his orders every time he touched the key. Spence was both hurried and anxious that night, and the key was busy. In the somewhat dim light, Spence, to Noodle's fancy, assumed the aspect of an animated jumping jack. Deftly, through long experience, Noodles coiled his pin with a wicked upshoot to the center of attack, cautiously lowered his own chair, which had been tilted back against the wall, to the more stable position of four legs on the floor, leaned forward, and laid the pin at a strategic point on the seat of Spence's chair. Two minutes later, kicked bodily down the stairs, Noodles was surveying the big cloud yards by moonlight from the perspective of the station platform. Noodles' career as a call boy had been brief, and it was ended. Old Bill, the boiler washer, came to the rescue. He explained to Regan who the godfather of the boy was, and what bearing that had on the case, and how he'd larrupt the boy for what he'd done, and how the boy hadn't meant anything by it, and could the boy have another chance. Regan said, yes, and it said it shortly, more because he was busy at the time and wanted to get rid of old Bill than from any predisposition toward Noodles. Noodles wasn't predisposing anyway, you looked at him, and Regan had a good look at his godson now for about the first time since he'd sponsored him, and he didn't like Noodles' looks particularly. But Regan, not taking too serious a view of the matter, said yes, and put Noodles at work over in the roundhouse under the eye of his father. Here, for a month, in one way or another, Noodles succeeded in making things lively, and himself cordially disliked by about everybody in the shops, the roundhouse, and the big cloud yards generally. And there was a hint or two thrown out that reached Regan's ears that old Bill had known what he was doing when he got one of the big fellows as godfather for as ugly a blasted little nuisance as the Hill Division had known for many a long day. Regan got to scowling every time he saw Noodle's unhandsome countenance, and he took pains on more than one occasion to give a bit of blunt advice to both Noodle's and Noodle's father, which the former received somewhat ungraciously, and the latter with trepidation. And then one night, as it grew dark, just before six o'clock, while Bill and the Turner and the Wipers were washing up and trying to put in the time before the whistle blew, Noodles dropped into the turntable pit and wedged the turntable bearings with iron wedgings. Half an hour later, when the night crew came to swing it for the 1016, blowing hard from a full head of steam and ready to go out and couple on to number one for the westbound run, they couldn't move it. It took them a few minutes before they could find out what the matter was, and another few to undo the matter when they did find out, and number one went out five minutes late. Nobody asked who did it. It wasn't necessary. They just said noodles, and waited to see what noodles' godfather would do about it. They did not have long to wait. 
the limited five minutes late out of division and the delay up to the motive power department which was regan's department would have been enough to bring the offender whoever he might be on the carpet with scant ceremony even if it had been an accident regan was boiling mad noodles didn't show up the next day deep in noodles consciousness was a feeling that his nickel thriller and a certain spot he knew up behind the butte where many a pleasant afternoon had been passed when he should have been at school was more conducive to peace and quietness than the center of the railroad activities also noodles ached bodily from his father's attentions old bill too kept conveniently out of sight down in a pit somewhere every time the master mechanic showed his nose inside the roundhouse during the morning but by afternoon counting the edge of regan's wrath to have worn smooth he followed regan out over the turntable after one of the master mechanic's visits regan he blurted out anxiously about the boy now well snapped regan whirling about the monosyllable was cold enough in its uncompromise to stagger the little ostler and drive all thoughts of the carefully rehearsed oration he had prepared from his head he scratched aimlessly at the half-circle of grey billy-goat beard under his chin and blinked helplessly at the master mechanic noodles lacked much and in noodles was much to be desired perhaps but noodles for all that had his place in the irish heart that beat under the greasy jumper he's the only one we've got regan stammered the harassed roundhouse man appealingly it's a wonder then you've not holes in the knees of your overalls giving thanks for it declared regan grimly that's enough bill and we've had enough of noodles keep him away from here ah sure now regan begged the little hostler piteously yes don't mean it the boy's all right regan tis but spirit he has uh, regan listen here now i've larruped him good for what he's done and twas no more than a joke a joke regan choked then brusquely that'll do bill i've said my last word and i'm busy this afternoon noodles is out for keeps ah regan listen here Noodle's father caught the master mechanic's arm as the latter turned away. Regan, sure, it's the boy's good father, yes, are. The fat little master mechanic's face went suddenly red. This was the last straw. Noodle's godfather. Regan had been catching more whispers than he had liked lately, and anent godfathers and godfathering. His eyes puckered up, and he wheeled on the boiler washer, but the hot words on the tip of his tongue died unborn. There was something in the dejected droop of the other's figure, something in the blue eyes growing watery with age that made him change his mind. Old Bill wasn't a young man. As far as the big-hearted, good-natured master mechanic could remember, he remembered old Bill in the roundhouse. Always the same job, day after day, year after year. Boiler washing, tinkering around it, odd jobs, not much good at anything else church every sunday in shiny black coat and peaked faced mrs mcguire in the same threadbare shiny black dress not that regan ever went to church but he used to see them going there church every sunday mcguire was long on church and weekdays just boiler washing and tinkering around at odd jobs a dollar sixty a day regan's pucker subsided and he reached out his hand to the boiler washer's shoulder and he grinned to kind of take the sting out of his words. Well, Bill, he said, as far as that goes, I renounce the honor. Renounce it? The boiler washer's eyes opened wide, and his face was strained as though he had not heard aright. Renounce it? It's an Irish Protestant, yes, our Reagan, the same as me and the missus, and did you not hear the words in the church? I did, admitted Regan, though I've forgotten what they were. It was well enough, no doubt, for the kid in swaddling clothes, but it's some time since then. Then, with finality, go back to your work, Bill. I can't talk to you any more this afternoon. Renounce it! The words reached Regan as he turned away and started across the tracks toward the platform, and in their tones was something akin to stunned awe that caused him to chuckle. Renounce it! And you said the word for an instant priest! Regan's chuckle, however, was not of long duration, either literally or metaphorically. 
During the rest of the afternoon, the boiler washer's words got to swinging through Regan's brain until they became an obsession, and somewhere down inside of him began to grow an uncomfortable foreboding that there might be something more to the godfathering business than he had imagined. He tackled Carleton about it before the whistle blew. Carleton, said he, walking into the super's office and picking up a ruler from the other's desk, don't laugh or I'll jam this ruler down your throat. If you can answer a straight question, answer it. Otherwise, let it go. What's a godfather, anyhow? Carleton grinned. You ought to know, Tommy, he said. Well, I was running without a permit and off schedule at the time, and I, I was nervous, said Regan. What happened, or, or what the goings-on were, I don't know. What is it? Carleton shook his head gravely. I'm afraid not, Tommy, he said. You're in the wrong shop. Information bureau's downstairs to the right of the ticket office. Thanks, said Regan. And that was all the help he got from Carleton, then. But that night over their usual game of Pedro in the super's office, it was a little different. Carleton, as he pulled the cards out of the desk drawer and tossed them on the table, pulled a small book from his pocket and tossed it to Regan. What's this? inquired the master mechanic. It's not to your credit to ask. It's a prayer book. Carleton informed him. Be careful of it. I borrowed it. You didn't need to say so, said Regan softly. Page 208, suggested Carleton. See if that's what you were looking for, Tommy. Regan thumbed the leaves, found the place, and began to read, and a sickly sort of pallor began to spread over his face. You are his sureties that he will renounce the devil and all his works, he mumbled weakly. Yes, said Carleton cheerfully. That's some little responsibility there, you see. But don't skip the parenthesis. Get it all, Tommy, until he comes of age to take it upon himself. Regan didn't say a word, nor was the smile he essayed an enthusiastic success. He read the articles over again, word by word, pointing the lines with his pudgy forefinger. Well, inquired Carleton, what do you make of the running orders, Tommy? The devil and all his works. It came away from Regan now with a rush from his overburdened soul. Do you mean to say that, that, uh, Regan choked a little, that, that I'm responsible for that brick-top monkey-faced kid? Until he comes of age, Carleton amplified pleasantly. Regan's Celtic temper rose. I'll see him hung first, he roared suddenly. Twas no more than to please Maguire that I stood up with the ugly imp. And maybe I said what's here, and maybe I didn't. But in any event, tis no more than a matter of form to be repeated, parrot fashion, and it means nothing. Oh, well, said the super, slyly, if you feel that way about it, don't let it bother you. It will not bother me, said Regan defiantly, with a scowl. But it did. Regan slept that night with an army corps of red-headed, pocketed, and freckled-faced little devils to plague his rest, and their name was Noodles. His thoughts were unpleasantly more on Noodles than his razor when he shaved the next morning, and the result was an unsightly gash across his chin, and when he made his first inspection of the roundhouse an hour later he was in a temper to be envied by no man. His irritability was not soothed by the sight of Maguire who rose suddenly in front of him from an engine pit as he came in. "'Regan,' said the old fellow, "'about the boy.' "'Maguire,' said Regan, in a low, fervent voice, "'you bother me about that again, and I'll fire you, too.' "'Wait, Regan!' There was a quaver in the little ostler's voice, and he appeared to stand his ground only by the aid of some previously arrived at painful resolution that rose superior to nervousness. "'Wait, Regan!' Maybe you shall not have to. I talked it over with the missus last night. I've worked well for yous, Regan, all these years. All these years, Regan. I've worked for yous here in the roundhouse. And I've worked well, though it's myself that says it. That's nothing to do with it, snapped the master mechanic. And maybe it has, and maybe it hasn't. The watery blue eyes sought the toes of their owner's grease-smeared, thickly patched brogans. I talked it over with the missus. Sure, sure now, Regan, just weren't thinking what you said, and just didn't mean what you said yesterday about renouncing the word you'd passed. You'll take it back, Regan. Take it back? I'll be damned if I do. 
said Regan earnestly. The little ostler's body stiffened, the watery blue eyes lifted and held steady on the master mechanic, and for the first time in his lowly life he raised a hand to his superior. McGuire pointed a forefinger, that shook a little, at Regan. "'Tis blasphemous you are, Regan,' he said in a thin voice. "'And tis no blasphemy, I mean. God forbid, for when I say yous will be damned if yous don't. Before a priest, Regan, and in the church of God, Regan, you swore for what you swore. And tis the wrath of God, Regan, yous will bring down on your head. Mind that, Regan. Fire me, is it?' The little ostler's voice rose suddenly. All these years I've worked well for yous, Regan, but I'll work no more for a man as'll do a thing like that. And the missus says the same. Poor we may be, but respect for ourselves we have. Yous'll never fire me, Regan. I fire meself. I'm through this minute. Regan glared disdainfully. Have you been drinking, Maguire? He inquired caustically. Noodle's father did not answer. He brushed past the master mechanic, walked through the big engine doors, and halted just outside on the cinders. "'Tis forsworn yous are, Regan,' he said heavily. "'Yous make light of it now, but the day'll come, Regan, for when yous'll find out tis no light matter. Tis the wrath of God, Regan'll pay yous for it. Yous can mark my words.' Regan stared after the old man, his eyes puckered, his face a little red, stared after the bent form in the old worn overalls as it picked its way across the tracks, and gave vent to his feelings by expectorating a goodly stream of blackstrap juice savagely into the engine pit at his side. This did not help very much, and for the rest of the morning, while he inwardly anathematized Noodles, Noodles' father, and the whole Noodles' family collectively, he made things both uncomfortable and lively for those who were unfortunate enough to be within reach of his displeasure. "'The wrath of God,' communed Regan angrily. "'I always said Noodles took after his father both by disposition and looks. It'll be a long time before the old man gets another job. A long time.' And therein Regan was right. It was a long time. Quite a long time, measured by the elasticity of the boiler washer's purse— which wasn't very elastic on the savings from a dollar sixty a day. Old Bill McGuire, perhaps, was the only one who hadn't got quite the proper angle on the rights he carried, which were worse than those of a mixed local when the rails were humming under a stress of through traffic and the dispatchers were biting their nails to the quick trying to take care of it. Not possibly that it would have made any difference to the little worn-out ostler if he had, for whether from principle, having deep-seated awe for the church and its tenants that forbade even a tacit endorsement of what he considered Regan's sacrilege, or because of the public slight put upon his family, the roundhouse hadn't failed to hear his first conversation with Regan, and hadn't failed to let him know that they had, or maybe from a mixture of the two. McGuire was beyond question in deadly earnest. But if old Bill hadn't got his signals right and was reading green and white when it should have been red, the rest of the Hill Division wasn't by any means colorblind. It was pretty generally understood that for several years back all that stood between McGuire and the scrap heap was Regan, not on account of any jolly business about godfather or godfathering, but because that was Regan's way. Old Bill puttered around the roundhouse on sufferance, thanks to Regan, and didn't know it, though everybody else did, barring patient little Mrs. McGuire and Noodles, who didn't count anyway. Nor did the little ostler even now pass the color test. Short-tongued, hard, grimy lot, just what their rough-and-ready life made them, they might have been, those railroaders of the Rockies, but their hearts were always right. In the yards, in the trainmaster's office, in the roadmaster's office, they pointed McGuire to the quiet times, to the extra crews laid off, to the spare men back to their old ratings, to the section gangs pared down to a minimum, and advised him to ask Regan for his job back again. They never told him he couldn't do a man's work any more. Ask, ask Regan, stuttered the old boiler washer, and the gray billy goat beard under his chin as he threw his head up, stuck out straight like a belligerent chevaux de free. Never, mind that now, never, never, till he takes back for what he said, not if I starve for it. 
End of chapter 7, part 1「Chapter Seven, Part Two of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Seven: The Devil and All His Works, Part Two. Regan, during the first few days, the brunt of his temper worn off, experienced a certain relief that was no little relief. He was rid and well rid of the noodles combination. But at the end of about a week, the bluff, big-hearted master mechanic began to suck in his under lip at moments when he was alone, as the stories of old Bill's futile efforts after a job and old Bill's rather pitiful defiance began to sift into him. Regan began to have visions of the little three-room shack way up in the waste fields at the end of Main Street. A dollar sixty a day wasn't much to come and go by even when the dollar sixty was coming regularly every payday, and when it wasn't, the cost of food and rent didn't go down any. Regan got to thinking a good deal about the faded little old drudge of a woman that was Mrs. McGuire, and the bare floors as he remembered them even in the palmy days of Noodle's birth when he had attended the celebration, bare but scrubbed to a spotless white. She hadn't been young then, and not any too strong, and that was twelve years ago. And he got to thinking a good deal about old Bill himself. Not much good any more, but good enough for a dollar sixty a day from a company he'd served for many a long year in the roundhouse. There had never been over much of what even an optimistic imagination could call luxury in the Maguire's home and the realization got kind of deep under the worried master mechanic's skin that things were down now to pretty near a case of bread to fill their mouths. And Regan was right. Even a week had been long enough for that. A man out of a job can't expect credit on the strength of the pay car coming along next month. Things were in pretty straitened circumstances up at the Maguire's. And the more Regan thought, the hotter he got under the collar, at Noodles, where he had formerly disliked and submitted to Noodles' existence in a passive sort of way, now he hated Noodles in a most earnest and wholehearted way, and with an unholy desire in his soul to murder Noodles on sight. For even if Noodles was directly responsible, and at the bottom of the pass things had come to, Regan's uncomfortable feeling grew stronger each day that indirectly he had his share in the distress and want that had moved into headquarters up at the top of Main Street. It wasn't a nice feeling or a nice position to be in, and Regan writhed under it, but primarily he cursed noodles. There was nothing small about Regan. There never was. He wasn't small enough not to do something. He couldn't very well ask the yardmaster or the section boss to give McGuire a job when he wouldn't give the old man one himself, so he sent word up to McGuire to come back to work in the roundhouse. McGuire's answer differed in no whit from the answer he had made to Gleason, the yardmaster, and everyone else to whom he had applied for a job. McGuire was in deadly earnest. Never, said he to the messenger who bore the olive branch. Mind that no, never till he takes back what he said. Not if I starve for it. Regan swore, and here Regan stuck. Noodles. His gorge rose until he choked. Kill the brat? Yes, murder was in Regan's soul. But to proclaim Noodles as a godson, Noodles as a godson. He had done it once, not knowing what he was doing, and to do it now with the years of enlightenment upon him, Regan choked, that was all, and grew apoplectically red in the face. It wasn't the grins and laughs of the Hill Division that he knew were waiting for him if he did. It was just noodles. When Regan had calmed down from the explosion, he inevitably, of course, got back to the old perspective, and for another week the McGuire family up Main Street occupied a reserved seat in his mind. Carlton only spoke to him once about it, and that was along toward the end of the second week, as they were walking uptown together at the dinner hour. "'By the way, Tommy,' said the super, 
How's McGuire getting along? Regan's thoughts having been on the same subject at the moment, he came back a little crossly. Blamed if I know, he growled. Carlton smiled. Moved by the same motive, perhaps, he had gone into the cash grocery store on the corner the day before and found that McGuire's credit was re-established, thanks to Regan, though Timmins, the proprietor, had been sworn to secrecy. "'One of you two will have to capitulate before very long,' he said, with a side glance at Regan. "'And I don't think it will be McGuire.' "'Don't you?' Regan flung out. "'You think it will be me?' <laughs> "'Yes,' laughed Carleton. "'When I'm dead,' said Regan shortly. "'Had any word from those Western House fittings yet? "'I'm waiting for them now.' "'I'll see about them,' said Carleton. "'I'm going east this afternoon.' "'And there wasn't any more said about Maguire. "'Meanwhile, if Regan's rancor against Noodles "'had reached a stage that was acute, "'Noodles had reached a stage of reciprocative hatred "'that was positively deadly.' So far as elemental passion and savagery had developed in twelve years, and Noodles was not a backward boy, just so far had he developed his malevolence against Regan. Things were in a pretty strained condition in the environment of the Maguire shack. Noodles was unhappy all the time, and hungry most of the time. He heard a good deal about Regan and the depths a man could sink to, and enough about the immutable inviolability of church tenets and ordinances to satisfy the most fanatic discipline of orthodoxy, to say nothing of the deep-seated conviction of the wrath of God that must inevitably fall upon one who had the sacrilegious temerity to profane those tenets. Mostly Noodles imbibed this at twilight over the sparsely set table, and when the twilight faded and it grew dark, they weren't using kerosene any more at the Maguires, he could still sense the look on his mother's face that mingled anxiety and gentle reproof, and he edged back his chair out of reach of his father's cuffs, which he could dodge in the daylight and couldn't in the dark, for on one point Regan and the old hostler were in perfect accord. "'I just had the cause of it!' Old Bill would shout, swinging the flat of his hand in the direction of Noodle's ear every time his violent oratory reached a climacteric height where a period became a physical necessity. Take it all around, what with the atmosphere of gloom, dodging his father's attentions, his mother's tears when he had caught her crying once or twice, and an unsatisfied stomach, black vengeance oozed from every pore of Noodle's body. His warty little fists clenched, and his unlovely face contorted into a scowl such as noodles, and only noodles, thanks to the background that nature had already furnished him to work upon, could scowl. Noodles set his brains to work. What he must do to Regan must be something awful and blood-curdling, and realizing, perhaps, that, being but twelve, he would be handicapped in coping with the master mechanic single-handed, he sought the means of assistance that most logically presented itself to him. Noodles lay awake nights trying to dovetail himself and Regan into the situations of his nickel thrillers. There wasn't any money with which to buy new nickel thrillers, but by then Noodles had accumulated quite a stock, and he knew them all off pretty well by heart, the essentials of them, anyhow. Noodles racked his brain for a week of nights, and was in despair. Not that the nickel thrillers did not offer situations harrowing enough to glut even his bloodthirsty little soul. They did. They were peaches. He could see Regan's blood all over the bank vault that the master mechanic had been trying to rob. He could see Regan walking the plank of a pirate ship while the pirates cheered hoarsely. And he fairly reveled in every one of them. Until cold despair would clutch again at his raging heart. They were peaches, all right, but somehow they wouldn't fit into Big Cloud. He couldn't figure out how to get Regan to rob a bank vault, and there weren't any pirates in the immediate vicinity that he had ever heard of. Then inspiration came to Noodles one night, and he sat bolt upright in bed. He would shadow Regan. A fierce, unhallowed joy took hold of Noodles. Noodles had grasped the constructive technique of the thriller. Every hero in every nickel thriller shadowed every villain to his doom. 
Regan's doom at the end was sure to take care of itself once he had found Regan out, but the shadowing came first. Noodle slept feverishly for the rest of the night, and the following evening he snooped down Main Street and took up his position in a doorway on the opposite side of the street from Regan's boarding house. In just what dire deed of criminal rascality he expected to trap the master mechanic he did not know, but that Regan was capable of anything, and that he would catch him in something, Noodles now had no doubt. That was what the shadowing was for. He grimly determined that he would be unmoved by appeals for mercy, and his heart beat high with optimistic excitement. Regan came out of the boarding-house, and barefooted in lieu of gumshoes and hugging the shadows a block behind, Noodles had refreshed his memory on the most improved methods. Noodles trailed the master mechanic down the street. Two blocks down, Regan halted on the corner and began to peer around him. Noodles' lips thinned suddenly. It began to look promising already. What was Regan up to? A man came down the cross street, joined Regan, and the two started on again toward the station. A little disappointed, Noodles, still hugging the shadows, resumed the chase. It was only Carlton, the superintendent. From the platform, Noodles watched the two men disappear through the far door of the station. Free from observation now, he hurried along the platform past the station, and was in time to see a lamp lighted upstairs in the side window of the super's office. Noodles waited a moment, then he tiptoed back along the platform and cautiously pushed open the door through which the others had disappeared. The door of the super's room on the upper story opened on the head of the stairs, and still on tiptoe, Noodles reached the top. Here, on his knees, his eyes glued to the keyhole, he peered into the room. Regan and the super were engaged in their nightly game of cards. There was nothing to raise Noodles' hopes in that, so he descended the stairs and took up his position behind the rain-barrel at the corner of the building where he could watch both the window and the entrance. At half-past ten the light went out, Regan and Carlton came down the stairs and headed uptown. Noodles, not forgetting the shadows, trailed them. At the corner where Carlton had joined Regan, Carlton left Regan, and Regan went on two blocks further and disappeared inside his boarding-house. Noodles, being a philosopher of a sort, told himself that none of the heroes ever succeeded the first night, and went home. The next night, and the three following nights, Noodles shadowed Regan with the same results. By the fifth night, with no single differing detail to enliven the somewhat monotonous and unproductive program, it had become dispiriting, and though Noodles' thirst for vengeance had not weakened, his faith in the nickel thrillers had. But on the sixth night, at the end of the second week since Noodles and Noodles' father had turned their backs upon the roundhouse, things were a little different. Noodles, in common with everyone else in Big Cloud, was quite well aware that the super's private car had been coupled on number 12 that afternoon, and that Carlton had gone east. Regan came out of his boarding house at the same hour as usual, and Noodles dodged along after him down the street. Noodles, by this time, for finesse, could have put a combination of Nick Carter and Old Sleuth on the siding until the grass sprouted between the ties. Noodles dodged along, in the shadows. Regan didn't stop at the corner this time, but he kept right along, heading down for the station. Regan passed two or three people going in the opposite direction up the street of the sleepy little mountain town, but this did not confuse Noodles. Noodles kept right along after Regan. There was no Carlton tonight, and Regan's criminal propensities would have full scope. Noodles' hopes ran high. Regan reached the station, went down the platform, and disappeared as usual through the same door. A little perplexed, Noodles followed along the platform, but a moment later, from his coin of vantage behind the rain-barrel, he saw the light flash out from the super's window, and his heart almost stood still. What was Regan doing in the super's office, alone? Noodles' face grew very white. Carlton had a safe there. He had got Regan at last. It had taken a lot of time, but none of the heroes ever got the villain until after pages and pages of trying to get him. He had got Regan at last. Noodles crept from the shelter of the rain-barrel stealthily as a cat, and, 
with far more caution than he had ever exercised before, pushed the outside door open and went up the stairs. There wasn't any hurry. He would give Regan time to drill through the safe, and perhaps even let the master mechanic get the money before giving the alarm. Noodles bitterly bemoaned the fact that he would have to give the alarm at all, and let anybody else in on it, but owing to the fact that he had been unable to finance a revolver with which to hold up the master mechanic red-handed and cover himself with glory at the same time, there appeared nothing else to do. It was just a step from the head of the stairs to the door of the super's room across the hall. Noodles negotiated it with infinite circumspection, and on his knees, as usual, his heart pounding like a trip-hammer, got his eye to the keyhole. He held it there a very long time, until he couldn't see any more through the hot, scolding, impotent tears. Then he edged back across the hall and sat down on the top step. Regan was playing solitaire. Hands dug disconsolately in his pockets, playing mechanically with a bit of cord that was about their sole contents. Noodles sat there, and his faith in nickel thrillers was shaken to the core. Noodle's thoughts were too complex for coherency, that is, for coherency in any but one of his thoughts. He hated Regan worse than ever, for he couldn't altogether expurgate the nickel thrillers from his mind on such a short notice, and he could hear Regan gloat and hiss, FOILED, in his ear. Noodle's hands came out of his pocket, with the cord. He wound one end around the banisters and began to seesaw it back and forth aimlessly in the darkness. There wasn't any good of shadowing Regan any more, but he wasn't through with Regan. Noodles had a soul above discouragement. Only, what was he to do? If the nickel thrillers had failed him in his hour of need, he would have to depend on himself. Only, what was he to do? Noodles stopped seesawing the cord suddenly and stared at it through the darkness, though he couldn't see it. Then he edged down another step, turned around on his knees, and knotted one end of the cord, it was a good stout one, to one side of the banisters, about six inches from the level of the hall floor. There was a banister railing on each side, and he stretched the cord tightly across to the other banister and knotted it there. That would do for a beginning. It didn't promise as gory a denouement as he thirsted for, and he was a little ashamed of the colorlessness of his expedient compared with those he'd read about. But there wasn't anybody else likely to use those stairs before Regan did, and it would do for a beginning. Regan would get a jolt or two before he reached the bottom. Noodles retreated down the stairs and retired to the rain barrel. Waits had been long there before, but tonight the time dragged hopelessly. He didn't expect to see very much, but he would be able to hear Regan coming down the stairs, so he waited, curbing his impatience by biting anxiously on the ends of his fingernails. Suddenly Noodles leaned head and shoulders far out from behind the rain barrel to miss no single detail of this, the initial act of his revenge, that he could drink in, his eyes fastened on the station door. The light in the window above had gone out. Very grim was Noodles' face, and his teeth were hard set together. There was no foolishness about this. The super's door upstairs opened and shut, Noodles leaned a little farther forward, out from the rain barrel. Meanwhile, Regan upstairs was not in a good humor. Regan, when alone, played a complicated and somewhat intricate species of solitaire, a matter of some pride to the master mechanic, and that evening he had had no luck. His combinations wouldn't work out. So, after something like fifteen abortive attempts that consumed the better part of an hour and a half, and victory still remaining an elusive thing, Regan chucked the cards back into Carlton's drawer in disgust, knocked the ashes out of his pipe, refilled the pipe for company homeward, and, growling a little to himself, blew out the super's lamp. He walked across to the door, opened and shut it, and stepped out into the hall. Here he halted and produced a match, both because his pipe was as yet unlighted and because the stairs were dark. He struck the match, applied it to the tamped tobacco, puffed once, and his eyes from the bowl of his pipe focused suddenly downward on the head of the stairs. 
Regan's round, fat little face went a color that put the glowing end of the match still held mechanically over the pipe bowl to shame, and the fist that wasn't occupied with the match clenched with the wrath that engulfed him. Noodles! For a moment, breathing heavily with rage, Regan glared at the cord. Then the match, burning his fingers, did not soothe him any, and he dropped it hastily, swearing earnestly to himself. Then he bent down, cut away the cord with his knife, and in grim, laborious silence, Regan was a heavy man, and the stairs had a tendency to creak that was hard to suppress, descended step by step. Regan was consumed with but one desire for the present or the hereafter, to get his hands on Noodles. Where Noodles had been stealthy, Regan was now positively devilish in his caution and cunning. Step by step he went down, testing each foothold much after the fashion of a cat that stretches out its paw, and finding something not quite to its liking draws it back, and shaking it vigorously tries again more warily, and the while a fire unquenchable burned within him. He reached the door at the bottom, found the knob, waited an instant, then suddenly flung the door wide open and sprang out on the platform. Noodle's form, projecting eagerly far out from the rain barrel not five yards away, was the first thing his eyes lighted upon. Regan had no time to waste in words. He made a dash for the rain barrel, and Noodles, with a sort of surprised squeak of terror, turned and ran. A fat man, ordinarily, cannot run very fast, and neither can a twelve-year-old boy. But with vengeance supplying wings to the one and terror imparting haste to the other, the time they made from the rain barrel along the platform past the baggage room and freight shed, off the platform to the ground and up the track to the construction department's storehouse, a matter of a hundred and fifty yards, stands good today as a record in Big Cloud. It was pretty near a dead heat. Noodles had five yards start when he left the rain barrel, and when he reached the end of the storehouse he had five yards lead, no more. A premonition of disaster began to twine itself around Noodle's heart in a sickly, dispiriting way. He dashed along beside the wall of the building, and after him lunged Regan, grunting like a grampus, a threat in every grunt. It was a long, low, windowless building, and halfway up its length was the door. Noodles had known the door to be unlocked at nights for the purpose of loading rush material for the bridge gangs in the mountains to go out by the early morning freight west at 4.10, and his hope lay in the door being open now. The place was full to the ceiling with boxes, bales, casks, barrels, and kegs, and amongst them in the darkness, being of small dimensions himself, he could soon lose Regan. He reached the door, snatched at the latch, the door was unlocked, and with an uplift immeasurable upon his young soul that gave vent to itself in a hoot of derision, Noodles flung himself inside. Regan, still panting earnestly, the beads on his brow now embryonic fountainheads that sent trickling streams down his face, lurched, pretty well winded, through the door five yards behind Noodles. And then Regan stopped, and the thought of Noodles was swept from Regan's mind in a flash. The smell of smoke was in his nostrils, and like... A white, misty cloud in the darkness had hung around him, and, through it, up toward the far end of the shed, a, a fire showed yellow and ugly, that with a curious, hissing, sibilant sound flared suddenly bright, then died to yellow ugliness again. Grim-faced now, his jaws clamped hard, Regan sprang forward toward the upper end of the shed. What was a fire he did not know, nor what had caused it though the latter, probably by a match, dropped maybe hours ago by a careless Polack, that had caught and set something smoldering, and that was now breaking into flame. All Regan knew, all Regan thought of then, was the powder. There were fifty kegs of giant blasting powder massed together there somewhere ahead, and just beyond where the fire was flinging out its challenge to him, enough to wreck not only the shed but half the railroad property in Big Cloud as well. Up the little handcar tracks between the high-piled stores Regan ran, and halted where a spurt of flame ending in a vicious puff of smoke shot out beside him, low down on the ground. It was light enough now, and in a glance the master mechanic caught the black grains of powder strewing the floor where a broken keg had been rolled along. A little alleyway had been left here running to the wall, and the fire itself was bursting from a case in the rear and bottom tier of stores on one side of this. On the other side were piled the powder kegs, and the space between, the width of the alleyway, 
was no more than a bare five or six feet. There was no time to wait for help. The powder grains crunched under his feet and ran little zigzag fizzy lines of fire like a miniature inferno as the sparks caught them. At any moment it might reach the kegs, and then... Regan flung himself along the alleyway to the rear tier of cases. They were small ones here, though piled twice the height of his head. If he could wrench them away, he could get at the burning case below. Regan bent, strained at the cases. They were light and moved. He heaved again to topple them over, and then, as a rasping, ripping sound reached him from above, he let go his hold to jump back. Too late! A heavy casting that had been placed on top of the cases, evidently for economy of space, came hurtling downward, struck Regan on the head, glanced to his shoulder and arm, slid with a thump to the ground, and Regan dropped like a log. A minute, perhaps two, it had all taken, no more. Noodles, crouched down against a case just inside the door, had seen the master mechanic rush by him, and Noodles, too, had seen the flame and smelt the smoke. Noodles' first impulse was to make his escape, his next, to see if he could not turn this unexpected intervention of fate to his own account and anent the master mechanic. Noodles heard Regan moving about, and he stole silently in that direction. Then Noodles heard the heavy thump of iron, the softer thud of Regan's fall, and something inside him seemed to stop suddenly, and his face went very white. "'Mr. Regan! Mr. Regan!' he stammered out. There was no answer, no sound, save an ominous crackle of burning wood. Noodles stole further forward, and then, as he reached the spot where Regan lay, he stood stock still for a second, petrified with fear, but the next instant, screaming at the top of his voice for help, he threw himself upon Regan, pounding frantically with the flat of his hands at the master mechanic's shoulder, where the other's coat was beginning to blaze. Somehow Noodles got this out, and then, still screaming for help, began to drag Regan away from the side of the blazing case. But Regan was a heavy man, almost too much for Noodles. Noodles, choking with the smoke, his eyes fascinated with horror as they fixed, now on the powder kegs, whose unloading in company with a dozen other awestruck boys he had watched a few days before, now on the sparkling, fizzing grains of powder upon the floor, tugged and wriggled and pulled at the master mechanic. Inch by inch, Noodles won Regan to safety. And then, on his hands and knees, he went back to sweep the grains away from the edge of the kegs. They burnt his hands as he brushed them along the floor, and he moaned with the pain between his screams for aid. It was hot in the narrow place, so narrow that the breath of flame swept his face from the case, but there was still some powder on the floor to brush back out of the way, little heaps of it. Weak and swaying on his knees, Noodles brushed at it desperately. It seemed to spurt into his face, and he, he couldn't breathe any more, and he couldn't see and his head was swirling around queerly. He staggered to his feet as there came a rush of men, and, and Clarihue, the turner, with the night crew of the roundhouse, came racing up to the shed. "'Good God, what's this?' cried Clarihue. It's, "'It's a fire,' said Noodles, with a sob, and fell into Clarihue's arms. They told Regan about it the next day when they had got his head patched up and his arms set. Regan didn't say very much as he lay in his bed. But he asked someone to go to McGuire's and ask old Bill to come down. And an hour later McGuire entered the room, but he halted a good yard away from the foot of Regan's bed. "'You sent for me, Regan,' observed the little ostler in non-committal, faraway tones. "'I did, McGuire,' said Regan diplomatically. "'Things haven't been going as smooth as they might have over in the roundhouse since you left, and I want you to come back. What do you say?' "'Tis not what I say,' said Maguire, and he moved no nearer to the bed. "'Tis whither your son saith what you said yourself. Do you take it back, Regan?' "'I do,' said Regan, in grave tones, but his hands reached up to help the bandages hide his grin. "'I take it all back, Maguire, every word of it.' "'That's all right, then,' said the little ostler, not arrogantly, but as one justified. I'm sorry to see you are sick, Regan, and I'm glad to see you are better. But did I not warn you, Regan? Twas the wrath of God, Regan, that's the cause of this. Maybe, said Regan softly. Maybe, but to my thinking, 
"'Twas the devil in all his works.' "'What's that?' inquired McGuire, bending forward. "'I didn't catch what you said, Regan.' "'I said,' said Regan, choking a little, "'that Noodles is a godson any godfather would be proud to have.' Well, "'Sure he is,' said Noodles' father cordially. "'He is thought.' End of chapter 7「8. Part 1 of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter 8. On the Night Wire, Part 1. Tommy Regan speaks of it yet. So does Carleton. And so, for the matter of that, does the Hill Division generally. And there's a bit of a smile goes with it, too but the smile comes through as a sort of feeble thing from the grim set of the lips. They remember it. It is one of the things they have never forgotten. Dan McGrew and the Kid, and the night the circus special pulled out of Big Cloud with Bull Coussarat and Fatty Hogan in the cab. Neither the Kid nor McGrew were what you might call born to the Hill Division. Neither of them had been brought up with it, so to speak, the kid came from an eastern system, and McGrew came from God knows where. To pin McGrew down to anything definite or specific in that regard was something just a little beyond the ability of the Hill Division. But it was fairly evident that where railroads were there, McGrew had been. He was old enough, anyway, and he knew his business. When McGrew was sober, he was a wizard on the key. But McGrew's shame was drink. McGrew dropped off at Big Cloud one day, casually, from nowhere, and asked for a job dispatching. A man in those days out in the New West wasn't expected to carry around his birth certificate in his vest pocket. He made good, or he didn't, in the clothes he stood in, and that was all there was to it. They gave him a job assisting the latest new man on the early morning trick as a sort of test, found that he was better, a long way better, than the latest new man, gave him a regular dispatcher's trick of his own, and thought they had a treasure. For a month they were warranted in their belief, for all that McGrew personally appeared to be a rather rough card, and then McGrew cut loose. He went into the Blazing Star Saloon one afternoon, and he left it only when deposited outside on the sidewalk as it closed up at four o'clock on the following morning. This was the hour McGrew was supposed to sit in for his trick at the key but McGrew was quite oblivious to all such considerations. A freight crew, just in and coming up from the yards, carried him home to his boarding house. McGrew got his powers of locomotion back far enough by late afternoon to reach the Blazing Star again, and the performance was repeated. McGrew went the limit. He ended up with a week in the hands of little Dr. McTurk. McTurk was scientific from the soles of his feet up, and earnestly professional all the rest of the way. When McGrew began to get a glimmering of intelligence again, McTurk went at him red-headed. "'Your heart's bad,' the little doctor flung at McGrew, and there was no fooling in his voice. "'So is your liver, cirrhosis, but mostly your heart. You'll try this just once too often, and you'll go out like a collapsed balloon, out like the snuffing of a candle-wick.' McGrew blinked at him. "'I've heard that before,' said he indifferently. "'Indeed,' snapped the irascible little doctor. "'Yes,' said McGrew, "'quite a few times. "'This ain't my maiden trip. "'You fellows make me tired. "'I'm a pretty good man yet, ain't I? "'And I'm likely to be when you're dead. "'I've got my job to worry about now, "'and that's enough to worry about.' "'Got any idea what Carlton said about it?' "'You'll keep this up,' said McTurk, sharply, refusing to sidestep the point, as, bag in hand, he moved toward the door. "'And it won't interest you much what Carlton or anybody else says. Mark my words, my man.' It was Tommy Regan, fat-paunched, big-hearted, good-natured, who stepped into the breach. There was only one place on this wide earth in Carlton's eyes for a railroad man who drank when he should have been on duty— and that was a six-foot trench three feet deep. In Carleton's mind, from the moment he heard of it, McGrew was out. But Regan saved McGrew, and the matter was settled, 
as many a matter had been settled before, over the nightly game of Pedro between the superintendent and the master mechanic, upstairs in the super's office over the station. Incidentally, they played Pedro because there wasn't anything else to do, nights. Big Cloud in those days wasn't boasting a grand opera house, and the movies were still things of the future. "'It's a pretty rough case, I guess, but give him a chance,' said Regan. "'A chance!' exclaimed Carleton with a hard smile. "'Give a dispatcher who drinks a chance to send a trainload or two of souls into eternity and about a hundred thousand dollars' worth of rolling stock to the junk heap while he's boozing over the key?' "'No,' said Regan. "'A chance to make good.' Carleton laid down his hand and stared across the table at the master mechanic. "'Go on, Tommy,' he prompted grimly. "'What's the answer?' "'Well,' said Regan, "'he's a past master on the key. We know that. That counts for something. What's the matter with sending him somewhere up the line where he can't get a drink if he goes to blazes for it? It might make a man of him and save the company a good operator at the same time we're not long on operators.' Mm, observed Carleton with a wry grin, picking up his cards again one by one. I suppose you've got some such place as uh, Angel Forks, for instance, in mind, Tommy. Yes, said Regan. I was thinking of Angel Forks. I'd rather be fired, submitted Carleton dryly. Well, demanded Regan, what do you say? Can he have it? Oh. No, yes, agreed Carleton, smiling. He can have that, after I've talked to him. We're pretty short on operators, as you say. Perhaps it will all work out. It will as long as he sticks, I guess, if you'll take it at all. He'll take it, said Regan, and be glad to get it. What do you bid? McGrew had been at Angel Forks, night man there, for perhaps the matter of a month, when the kid came to Big Cloud fresh from a key on the pen. They called him the kid because he looked it. He wasn't past the stage where he had to shave more than once a week. The kid, they dubbed him on the spot, but his name was Charlie Keene, a thin, wiry little chap with black hair and a bright, snappy, quick look in his eyes and face. He was pretty good on the key, too. Not a master like McGrew. He hadn't the experience, but pretty good for all that. He could send with the best of them, and there wasn't much to complain about in his taking, either. The day man at Angel Forks didn't drink. At least his way bill didn't read that way and they gave him promotion in the shape of a station farther along the line that sized up a little less tomb-like, a little less like a buried-alive sepulchre than Angel Forks did. And the kid, naturally, being young and new to the system, had to start at the bottom. They sent him up to Angel Forks on the morning way freight that day after he arrived in Big Cloud. There was something about the kid that got the train crew of the way freight from the start. They liked the man a whole lot and pretty sudden in their rough-and-ready way, those railroaders of the Rockies in those days, or they didn't like him well enough to say a good word for him at his funeral. That's the way it went. And the caboose was swearing by the kid by the time they were halfway to Angel Forks, where he shifted from the caboose to the cab for the rest of the run. Against the rules? Riding in the cab? Well, perhaps it is. If you're not a railroad man, it depends. Who was going to say anything about it? It was Fatty Hogan himself poking a long-spouted oil can into the entrails of the 428, while the train crew were throwing out tinned biscuits and canned meats and contract pie for the lunch counter at Elk River, who invited him anyhow. That's how the kid came to be acquainted with Hogan and Hogan's mate, Bull Kusarat, who was handling the shovel end of it. Kusarat was an artist in his way, apart from the shovel, and he started in to guy the kid. He drew a shuddering picture of the desolation and the general lack of what made life worth living at Angel Forks, which wasn't exaggerated because you couldn't exaggerate Angel Forks much in that particular respect, and he told the kid about Dan McGrew and how headquarters, it wasn't any secret, had turned Angel's Forks into what he called a booze fighter's sanatorium but he didn't break through the kid's optimism or ambition much of any to speak of. By the time the wave freight whistled for Angel Forks, the kid had Bull Kusarat's seat, and Kusarat was doing the listening, 
while Hogan was leaning toward them to catch what he could of what was going on over the roar and pound of the 428. There was better pay, and what counted most, better chances for a man who was willing to work for them out in the West than there was in the East, the kid told them with a quiet, modest sincerity, and that was why he had come out there. He was looking for a train dispatcher's key some day after he had got through station operating, and after that, well, something better still. There wasn't any jolly business or blowhard about the kid. He meant what he said. He was going up. And as far as McGrew was concerned, he'd get along with McGrew. McGrew, or any other man, wouldn't hold him back from the goal he had his eyes set upon and his mind made up to work for. There was perhaps a little more of the youthful enthusiasm in it that looked more buoyantly on the future than hard-headed experience would, but it was sincere, and they liked him for it. Who wouldn't? Bull Kusarat and Fatty Hogan in the days to come had reason to remember that talk in the cab. Desolate, perhaps, isn't the word to describe Angel Forks. For Angel Forks was pretty enough, if rugged grandeur is counted pretty. Across the track and siding, facing the two-story wooden structure that was the station, the bare gray rock of a cut through the mountain base reared upward to meet a pine-covered slope, and then blend with bare gray rock, once until it became a glaciered peak at the skyline. Behind the station was a sort of plateau, a little valley, green and velvety, bisected by a tumbling, rushing little stream, with the mountains again closing in around it, towering to majestic heights, the sun playing in relief and shadow on the fantastic, irregular, snow-capped summits. It was pretty enough. No one ever disputed that. The road hung four-by-five-foot photographs of it with eight-inch wide trimmed with gilt frames in the big hotel corridors east, and no one who ever bought a ticket on the strength of the photographer's art ever sent in a kick to the advertising department or asked for their money back. It looked all right from the car windows. But sign of habitation there was not, apart from the little station, not even a section man shanty, just the station. Angel Forks was important to the Transcontinental on one count, and on one count only, its siding. Neither freight nor passenger receipts were swelled twelve months in or twelve months out by Angel Forks. But geographically, the train dispatcher's office back in Big Cloud never lost sight of it. In the heart of the mountains, single-tracked, mixed trains, locals, way freight, specials, and the limiteds that knew no rights on earth but a clean-swept track with their crazy fast schedules, met and crossed each other as expediency demanded. So, in a way, after all, perhaps it was desolate, except from the car windows. Horton, the day-man that the kid was relieving, evidently had found it so. He was waiting on the platform with his trunk, when the way freight pulled in and he turned the station over to the kid without much formality. God be with you till we meet again, was about the gist of what Horton said, and he said it with a mixture of sympathy for another's misfortune and an uplift at his own escape from the bondage struggling for the mastery, while he waved his hand from the tail of the caboose as the way freight pulled out. There was mighty little formality about the transfer and the kid found himself in charge with almost breathtaking celerity. Angel Forks, Dan McGrew, Way Freight No. 47, and the man he had relieved were sort of hazy, nebulous things for a moment. There wasn't time for them to be anything else, for about one minute after he had jumped to the platform, he was OSing out the train that had brought him in. It wasn't quite what he had been used to back in the more sedate East, and he grinned a little to himself as his fingers tapped the key, and by the time he had got back his OK, the tail of the caboose was swinging a curve and disappearing out of sight. The kid then had a chance to look around him and look for Dan McGrew, the man who was to be his sole companion for the days to come. He found McGrew upstairs, after he'd explored all there was to explore of the ground floor of the station, which was a sort of combination kitchen, living room, and dining room that led off from the office, just the two rooms below with a ladder-like staircase between them leading up above. And above there was just the one room under the eaves with two bunks in it, one on either side. 
The night man was asleep in one of these, and the kid did not disturb him. After a glance around the rather cheerless sleeping quarters, he returned downstairs and started in to pick up the threads of the office. Dusk comes early in the fall in the mountains, and at five o'clock the switch and semaphore lamps were already lighted, and in the office under a green-shaded lamp the kid sat listening to some stray-time stuff coming over the wire when he heard the night man moving overhead and presently start down the stairs. The kid pushed back his chair, rose to his feet, and turned with outstretched hand to make friends with his new mate, and his outstretched hand drew back and reached uncertainly to the table edge beside him. For a long minute neither man spoke, staring into each other's eyes. In the opening through the partition at the foot of the stairs, Dan McGrew seemed to sway a little on his feet, and his face, what could be seen of it through the tawny beard that Angel Forks had offered him no incentive to shave, was ashen white. It was McGrew who broke the silence. "'Hello, Charlie,' he said in a sort of cheerful bravado that rang far from true. "'So you are Dan McGrew. The last time I heard of you your name was Brody.' The kid's lips, as he spoke, hardly seemed to move. "'I've had a dozen since then.' said McGrew in a pleading whine, more than a dozen. I've been chased from place to place. Charlie, I've lived a dog's life, and the kid cut him short in a low, passionate voice. And you expect me to keep my mouth shut about you here. Is that it? McGrew's fingers plucked nervously, hesitantly at his beard, his tongue circled dry lips, and his black eyes fell from the kid to trace aimlessly, it seemed, the cracks in the floor. The kid dropped back into his chair, and elbows on the table, chin in hand, stared out across the tracks to where the side of the rock cut was now no more than a black shadow. Again it was McGrew who broke the silence. What, what are you going to do? he asked miserably. What are you going to do? Use the key and put them wise? <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you, Charlie? You wouldn't throw me down, would you? I'm... I, I'm living decent here. The kid made no answer, made no movement. Charlie, McGrew's voice rose in a high-pitched nervous appeal. Charlie, w what are you gonna do? Nothing. The kid's eyes were still on the black rock shadow through the station window, and the words came monotonously. Nothing. As far as I'm concerned, you are Dan McGrew. McGrew lurched heavily forward, relief in his face and voice as he put his hands on the kid's shoulders. "'You're all right, Charlie, all right. I knew you wouldn't.' The kid sprang to his feet and flung the other's hands roughly from his shoulders. "'Keep your hands off me,' he said tensely. "'I don't stand for that. And let's understand each other. You do your work here and I do mine. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you to talk to me.' I don't want anything to do with you. That's as straight as I know how to put it. The first chance I get, I'll move. They'll never move you, for I know why they sent you here. That's all, and that's where we stand, McGrew. Do you mean that? said McGrew in a cowed, helpless way. The kid's answer was only a harsh, bitter laugh, but it was answer enough. McGrew, after a moment's hesitation, turned and went silently from the room. A week passed, and another week came and went, and neither man spoke to the other. Each lived his life apart, cooked for himself, and did his work, and it was good for neither one. McGrew grew morose and ugly, and the kid somehow seemed to droop, and there was a pallor in his cheeks and a listless air about him that was far from the cheery optimism with which he had come to take the key at Angel Forks. Two weeks passed. And then one night, after the kid had gone to bed, two men pitched a rough, weather-beaten tent on the plateau below the station. Hard-looking specimens they were, unkempt, unshaven, each with a mount and a pack-horse. Harvey and Lansing, they told McGrew their names were, when they dropped in for a social call that night, and they said they were prospectors. But their geological hammers were bottles of raw spirit that the Indians loved, and the veins of ore they tapped were the furs that an Indian will sell for red-eye when he will sell for no other thing on earth. 
It was against the law. Enough against the law to keep a man's mouth who was engaged in that business pretty tightly shut. But recognizing a kindred spirit in McGrew, and warmed by the bottle they had hospitably brought, before that first night was over no secret of that sort lay between them and McGrew. And so drink came to Angel Forks. And in a supply that was not stinted, it was Harvey and Lansing's stock in trade, and they were well stocked. McGrew bought it from them with cash and with provisions and played poker with them with a kitty for the red eye. There was nothing riotous about it at first, not bad enough to incapacitate McGrew, and it was a night or two before the kid knew what was going on, for McGrew was cautious. Harvey and Lansing were away in the mountains during the daytime, and they came late to fraternize with McGrew around midnight, long after the kid was asleep. Then McGrew began to tipple steadily, and signs of drink came patently enough too patently to be ignored one morning when the kid relieved McGrew and went on for the day trick. The kid said nothing. No word had passed between them for two weeks. But that evening, when McGrew in turn went on for his trick, the kid went upstairs and found a bottle, nearly full, hidden under McGrew's mattress. He took it, went outside with it, smashed it against a rock, and kept on across the plateau to the prospector's outfit. Harvey and Lansing, evidently just in from a day's lucrative trading, were unsaddling and busy over their pack animals. "'Hello, King!' they greeted in chorus, and Lansing added, "'Hang around a bit and join in. We're just going to cook grub.' The kid ignored both the salutation and the proffered hospitality. "'I came down here to tell you two fellows something,' he said slowly and there was a grim, earnest set to his lips that was not to be misunderstood. It's none of my business that you're camping around here, but up there is railroad property, and that is my business. If you show your faces inside the station again, or pass out any booze to McGrew, I'll wire headquarters and have you run in. And somehow, though I've only met you once or twice, I don't fancy you're anxious to touch head-on with the authorities. He looked at the two steadily for an instant while they stared back half angrily, half sheepishly. "'That's fair warning, isn't it?' he ended as he turned and began to retrace his steps to the station. "'You'd better take it. Now you won't get a second one.' They cursed him when they found their tongues and did it heartily, interwoven with threats and savage jeers that followed him halfway to the embankment. But their profanity did not cloak the fact that, to a certain extent, the kid's words were worthy of consideration. The extent was two nights, that night and the next one. On the third night, or rather far on in the early morning hours, the kid upstairs, awakened from sleep, sat suddenly up in his bunk. A wild outburst of drunken song, accompanied by fists banging time on the table, reached him, then an abashed hush, through which the click of the sounder came to him, and he read it mechanically. The dispatcher at Big Cloud was making a meeting point for two trains at the bend, forty miles away, nothing to do with Angel Forks. Came then a rough oath, another, and a loud, brawling altercation. The kid's lips thinned. He sprang out of his bunk, pulled on shirt and trousers, and went softly down the stairs. They didn't hear him. They were too drunk for that. They didn't see him until he was fairly inside the room, and then for a moment they leered at him, suddenly silent in a silly, owl-like way. There was anger upon the kid, a seething passion, that showed in his bloodless face and quivering lips. He stood for an instant motionless, glancing around the office. The table from the other room had been dragged in. On either side of it sat Harvey and Lansing. At the end, within reach of the key, sat Dan McGrew, swaying tipsily back and forth, cards in hand. Under the table was an empty bottle. Another had rolled into a corner against the wall, and on the table itself were two more bottles amongst greasy scattered cards, one almost full, the other still unopened. It's all right, Charlie, <laughs> hiccuped McGrew blandly. It's all right, just uh, having a little game. Good boy, Charlie. McGrew's words seemed to break the spell. With a jump, the kid reached him, flung him roughly from his seat, toppling him to the floor, and stretched out his hand for the key. But he never reached it. 
Harvey and Lansing, remembering the threat and having more reason to fear the law than on the simple count of trespassing on railroad property, lunged for him simultaneously. Quick as a cat on his feet, the kid turned and his fist shot out, driving full into Lansing's face, sending the man staggering backward, but Harvey closed. Purling oaths, Lansing snatched the full bottle, and as the kid, locked in Harvey's arms, swung toward him, he brought the bottle down with a crash on the back of the kid's head, and the kid slid limply to the floor. White-faced, motionless, unconscious, the kid lay there, the blood beginning to trickle from his head, and in a little way it sobered the two prospectors, but not McGrew. "'Say what's done?' said McGrew with a maudlin sob, picking himself up from where the kid had thrown him. "'Say what's done. Killed him. That's what's done.' It frightened them, McGrew's words, Harvey and Lansing. They looked again at the kid and saw no sign of life, and then they looked at each other. The bottle was still in Lansing's hand, and he set it back now on the table with a little shudder. Uh, we, "'We better beat it,' he croaked hoarsely. "'By daylight we want to be far away from here.' Harvey's answer was a practical one. He made for the door and disappeared, Lansing close on his heels. McGrew alternately cursed and pleaded with them long after they were out of earshot, and then, moved by drunken inspiration, started to clear up the room. He got as far as reaching for the empty bottles on the floor— and that act seemed to father a second inspiration. There were other bottles. He reeled to the table, picked up the one from which they had been drinking, stared at the kid upon the floor, brushed the hair out of his eyes, and throwing back his head, drank deeply. Yes, sir. Steady myself. Feel shaky, he mumbled. He stared at the kid again. The kid was beginning to show signs of returning consciousness. McGrew, blinking, took another drink. And I said dead out of the roll, said McGrew thickly. Oh, thank God, not dead after all. Then drunken cunning came into his eyes. He slid the full bottle into his pocket and, carrying the other in his hand, stumbled upstairs, drank again, and hid them craftily, not beneath the mattress this time, but under the eaves where the flooring met, and there was a loose plank. When he stumbled downstairs again, the kid was sitting in a chair, holding his swimming head in his hands. "'All right, Charlie,' said McGrew inanely. The kid did not look at him. His eyes were fixed upon the table. "'Where are those bottles?' he demanded suspiciously. "'Gone,' said McGrew plaintively. "'Gone with the fellas. The fellas took them and ran away.' "'What's going to do, do about it, Charlie?' "'I'll tell you when you're sober,' said the kid curtly. "'Get up to your bunk and sleep it off.' "'My trick,' said McGrew heavily, waving his hand toward the key. "'Well, I should f fella do my work.' "'Your trick!' The words came in a withering, bitter rush from the kid. "'Your trick! You're in fine shape to hold down a key, aren't you?' Oh, why should we reason I ain't? Held it down all right so far, said McGrew, a world of injury in his voice, and it was true, so far he had held it down all right that night, for the very simple reason that Angel Forks had not been the elected meeting point of trains for a matter of some three hours, not since the time when Harvey and Lansing had dropped in and McGrew had been sober. Get up to your bunk! said the kid between his teeth, and that was all. McGrew swayed hesitantly for a moment on uncertain legs, blinked soddenly a sort of helpless protest, and, turning, staggered up the stairs. For a little while the kid sat in his chair, trying to conquer his dizzy, swimming head, and then the warm blood trickling down his neck, he had not noticed it before, roused him to action. He took the lamp and went into the other room, bathed his head in the wash basin, sopping at the back of his neck to stop the flow, and finally bandaged it as best he could with a wet cloth as a compress and a towel drawn tightly around it, which he knotted on his forehead. He finished McGrew's abortive attempt at house cleaning after that, and sat in to hold down the rest of the night trick while McGrew, in sleep, should recover his senses. But McGrew did not sleep. 
McGrew was fairly started, and McGrew had two bottles at command. End of chapter 8, part 1